Jesus. Praise God. Praise the Lord. So excited to be here tonight in Patterson, Louisiana. Man, I, I never thought these, these days would come where God would send me to preach the gospel. Well, I'm excited to be here. I'm just excited about Jesus. Amen. 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 Excited Amen. about this message. I know right after I got saved, I was just so happy and so full of the love and the joy of God. And people would say, oh, just give it a little time. You'll be just like we are. That excitement, that feeling wears off. But I didn't believe them then and I don't believe them Amen. now. Amen. Still excited about Jesus. Hallelujah. Because now that we're in Christ, we're daily being changed. We're daily being conformed unto His image. And there's never a dull moment. Amen. You never know what the Lord is going to do next. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'm just thankful. Wow. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank Brother Matt very much for having me here and sharing his pulpit with me. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I know that I have the mind of the Lord tonight because what the brother sang, it goes right along with what I'm going to preach those last two songs. We're going to talk about the old man being dead. We're going to talk about any man being in Christ. He is a new creature. All yeah. things have passed away. All things have become new. But you know, a lot of people, they just want to stop right there and just sit in a church pew and just go to church on Sunday and that's all there ever is to our Christianity. But the Bible goes on to tell us here that He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. And just as the brother sang, there's lots of people out there that are never going to know about the love and joy and the salvation that God offers if they don't hear it from a preacher. And not just talking about somebody that stands behind the pulpit, but I, I heard a little long, a little line in that song said, God ordained you and me. Amen. God ordained you and me to go forth and preach the gospel Thank you, of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to talk to you tonight about a ministry of reconciliation. Amen. A ministry of reconciliation. You know, we... Uh, we, I think it's part of human nature to want to help other people. You know, sometimes we can be sensitive to the needs of other people. I'm going to be leaving about 3 o'clock in the morning, headed down to Honduras for a, a mission trip. And I know there's a lot of people that go uh, overseas into other countries to do missions and things like that. And a whole lot of the work that takes place is just humanitarian, such as drilling wells and taking blankets for naked people and clothing uh, and feeding homes hungry people and all that sorts of things, but the way that you and I can help somebody, the only way that we can help them is that we give them this gospel, Amen. that we give them the message of what Jesus did at the cross, otherwise you haven't helped them, doesn't matter what, how much their suit costs or what they've got in their belly or the water that they're drinking, Jesus said, what's it profit a man if he gains the whole world but yet loses his soul, That's right. so it matters about that soul, this body, this outer core, it's uh, it's temporary. That's right. Amen. It gets old. It ages. I pulled a muscle in my back yesterday. So even a, even a young body, I'm 23 years old, and I can tell that this body is not perfect. Amen. Sometimes it, it lets you down, and this is a, it's a temporary coil. Soon it's, it's going to be, a, it's going to perish in a grave, but the soul, the inner man, it lives forever. It's eternal, Amen. and it lives in one or two places, either heaven or hell. Right. And the only thing that can separate you from eternity and a devil's hell is Jesus Christ and the cross that he died on. For eternity. Amen. And if you've embraced that, if you believe that message from your heart, repenting of your sins, Amen. then the Bible says you've been made a new creature. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. A new creature. And only those that are in the message of the cross. And when I say the message of the cross, I'm not talking about somebody that uses that phrase every now and then or, or just uses that a motto or a mantra. But I'm talking about when a preacher preaches the message of the cross, it's every time that he opens up this Bible, he's taking the Scripture, the text, and tying it back to what Jesus did for you and I 2,000 years ago. Otherwise, it can't be applied to our lives. Come on. Otherwise, it's not applicable to us. Jesus is the truth, the way... And the life, but the only way that he's any of that to you and I is through the cross. That's, right. That's, That's where right. we partake of Christ. The Bible says in Romans 6 and verse 3, don't you know that as many of us were placed into Christ, were placed into Him at His death. That's right. At Amen. His death. So it's embracing Calvary. It's embracing the cross. 
That right. lets us have place in Jesus Hallelujah. and the benefits that he died to bring us. Everything else, it's not a ministry of reconciliation, but it's a ministry of death. Everything outside of faith and grace and what Christ did in, in, for, for us on the cross of Calvary, it's a law. Come on. It's law. Preachers nowadays, what's coming from most pulpits is do these three things. If you do these three things, and God's going to work in your life. Pray, read your Bible, come to church on Sunday. But I'm going to tell you, you can't you get anything from God by doing those come things on. as far as it goes with victory and salvation in our lives. The only thing that can get God to work in your life is that you submit to His plan, Jesus hey, Christ hey. and His cross. Oh, and when God sees oh, true faith... True faith, faith in Jesus and what He did for us at Calvary, then God rushes in and gives grace. He gives unmerited favor, the effectual working of the Spirit in our lives. And that's when we get something done. Otherwise, when you submit yourself to law, you just entice that sin nature. And the situation gets a whole lot worse then than what it was in the beginning. How many times have you tried to straighten up in your life and do better and do right just to end up, man, I'm further away now than I was in the beginning. That's where I come from. Tried to straighten up and do right and, you know, tuck my shirt in and do it, do it a little better this time. But I always ended up failing and getting further and further away from God. But it wasn't until I was reconciled unto God. My sin was put away, washed away by the blood of Jesus and then I had the power of the Spirit to work in my life to do what I wasn't able to do before. Amen. And it's a ministry of reconciliation. Understand that Christ is the reconciler. Hallelujah. He ultimately is the reconciler. You read in, in the ministry and the life of Jesus Christ people turn their nose up and say oh that man's over eating with sinners. They, they didn't like people like that but Jesus in his, in his heart and in his mind he was on the lookout out for somebody that a girl caught in adultery, or Zacchaeus, who's a thief, steals from everybody that he knows, a, a corrupt publican, or something like that. But Jesus didn't turn his nose up at people like that. But as a matter of fact, he ministered grace Hallelujah. to them, he ministered reconciliation to the people. And that's why you and I are on the earth today. It's not that we just get saved and fi find a pew to fall asleep in. But no, God has given us. Amen. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. It's not, a, it's not Christianity is not a passive religion, but this is a warfare. Amen. The Bible says that we're, we're good soldiers. That's right. In the army. We don't get tangled up with the things of this world. That's, that's what the devil tries to do with us. And I see it in my own life. The devil tries to get me so preoccupied with all stuff with my job and with my family and all this chaos that's going around. And when you got your mind stuck on the problems that you have back at work, you really can't minister to anybody else. Amen. That's why we need to be on guard for that, not to get caught up and tangled up in the cares of this world. Because the truth of it is, it doesn't matter how much money you make, what kind of car you drive, how big your house is, this whole mud ball is going to be destroyed on. one day soon. The king's coming Back. Amen. We're even up out of here. Amen. And we, we, we store up treasure in heaven Amen. where moth doesn't corrupt that dust, doesn't get on the treasure that's up in heaven. Whatever you got now, you go to the dealership tonight and buy the newest car they got. And in, in 10 years, man, you just got an old clunker. That's right. Yeah, what you driving that old thing for? But that's the way the world works. But Jesus, man, he doesn't get old. He, didn't, he doesn't get rusty. He don't have leaks. He don't, barons don't go out on Jesus. No, he, he gets more sweeter and more precious every day. As the day approaches, he gets, I just fall in love with Jesus every day. Just as we were talking before the service, man. And that's, that's what's to be in our heart. Not just a bunch of rules and laws and do this, don't do that. Man, what can I do? Just fall in love with Jesus. And if you've got a relationship with Him, He'll tell you what to do and what not to do. Amen. And when you're in a relationship with somebody that you love, Husband, you don't want to hurt your wife. Come on. Wife, you don't want to hurt your husband. That's what we work out of. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We don't want to, we don't want to sadden Him and His work in our life, but we want to be in compliance with Him. But the Lord knows the frailty of our flesh. That's why He gives us the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to do that which we can't do. You know what that is? That's grace. Yes. The divine influence on the heart and yes. its reflection in our life. Hallelujah. It's what God desires. Amen. Didn't won't charge you nothing for that. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Let's get into the scriptures. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. A new creature. And I just wanted to, uh, as, we were, as the brother was singing the song about the old man being dead, I just want to stop there and, and tell you that it says a new creature and not a perfect creature. Come on. One thing that I've learned since I've been preaching and, and I've been saved and dealing with other people is lots of times somebody will come and they'll be born again. God will do a great work in their heart and in their life, but somewhere along the line, they end up coming short, uh, falling short. They ended up failing God and it breaks our heart. It grieves us. Sin grieves the heart of a true child of God. Amen? Amen. But you need to understand that when you fail, that's not the end of it. I'm not telling you that you have a license to sin all you want to, but I am telling you that when you do fail, God's already made provision for you to get back up again and get back in the race. Yeah. We, had a, we had a tongues and interpretation at our church in Greenwood, Mississippi a while back, and, and God spoke, and He said that before the foundation of the world was laid, I made a way for you. Amen. Way back before any of this came to pass, God made a way for us. That way that He made, Revelation 13 8, Jesus Christ is a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So before the foundation of the world was laid, God knew that man would be here, man was going to fall, man was going to mess up and drop the ball, but God had already made a provision in His mind. It is finished. My son's going to come and pay the penalty for our sins and allow man to have relationship once again with God. Amen. And you know what I thought of when in that? Even before the foundation of the world was laid, God knew that Adam was going to fall. Yeah. That Adam was going to sin and mess. But listen, God had already made a way where Adam could have got back up again if he would have just got on board with the plan that God had made before the foundation of the world. You look there in Genesis chapter 3 and you'll see that right after Adam and Eve uh, failed, God rushed in with animal skins to clothe them and clothe their sinful flesh. And they could have had a relationship with, uh, again with God if they would have got on with the plan of God. That's right. But there's no evidence that they did that. Don't let failure be final. Get back up again. Hallelujah. Get back in the race. There's something in the past you think that messed you up and God can't use you anymore. You just need to come to the cross. You need to come to Calvary. Thank let the Lord. blood of Jesus cleanse yeah. you and let God put you back in the race again. Let faith arise. God, Brother Swaggart says, if you won't quit, God won't quit Amen. on you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of of reconciliation. And that's what I want to preach tonight, the ministry of reconciliation. Would you pray with me? Yeah. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you for every person that's gathered here tonight. Lord, we need you to speak to us. Lord, we ask for your anointing, Lord. And Lord, for your spirit to open our eyes, open our hearts. Lord, let the word of God come forth. Lord, I pray tonight if there's a person here, Lord, that's not saved, that's lost and dead in sin, God, I pray that they would not leave here in that condition. Lord, let us know tonight that the Holy Spirit is here and He wants to reconcile. He wants to draw all of us back unto You, O Lord. And Lord, let it be done. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. If any man be in Christ. You know, there was a time in the ministry of the Apostle Paul during his second missionary journey. The Apostle Paul was at, a, was at the city of Athens. And the Apostle Paul preached at Athens. He preached the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of the dead. And the Bible says that people mocked at him because he preached the resurrection of the dead. They ridiculed and, and laughed and scorned at Paul. And the Bible said that only 
only a certain few people believed on Christ. The rest of them just, uh, they didn't believe the message that he preached. And you can just tell that as the Apostle Paul left Athens, he was a little bit discouraged in the, the outcome of the, uh, of the evangelistic effort that he had made there in Athens. It wasn't as fruitful as he would have liked for it to be. And not as many people were saved. And I, the evidence is that maybe a church was not planted there as he would have liked to saw it. And the Apostle Paul, he left Athens on his way to Corinth. And at this time, Corinth was the most wicked and sinful city in the whole Roman Empire. It was a bad place. It was a place where you would want your kids to run in the streets. If you walk with your children down the streets of Corinth, you would want to cover their eyes and cover their ears because you wouldn't want them to see what was going on and the sin that took place in that city. There, there was a temple there where they worshipped their heathen gods. And it was said that there was a thousand uh, prostitutes inside of this temple where the men went and worshipped. And this is how they worshipped their uh, heathen gods. They would go in and commit adultery and commit fornication with the prostitutes inside the temple. One man that I read behind, he said that the Corinthian women were known, they were renowned for their immorality and perversion that, that came from there. It was a very wicked place. It was a place of great wealth. There was a lot of money in Corinth. But there was also a lot of sin. They were known worldwide for the wickedness and immorality that they had within this city. But on the flip side of that, Corinth, the people there, they prided themselves in their philosophy and in their knowledge. They thought that they had it, they had it all figured out. They were smarter than everybody else. And, and that's where knowledge came from, what was was from Corinth. And when you mix that, somebody that thinks they already know everything, a know-it-all, with all of that sin and wickedness, you've really got a mess on your hands. On. Somebody that is wicked as they can be, but in their own mind, they're self-deceived into thinking that they're smart. Yeah. And the Apostle Paul, he leaves Athens, he gets in a ship, and the ship sails over to a town called Centuria, I believe is how you pronounce it. And that's where the harbor was. They tied the ship up there at Centuria, and it was an eight mile walk from where the ship uh, was harbored into the city of Corinth. And the Bible said that the Apostle Paul, he made this journey alone. He walked eight miles by himself. And as he's walking this eight miles, you just know that the Apostle is, is seeking God and he's praying. He's a little bit discouraged about what happened over there at Athens. And he said, you know, Lord, I, I just preached at Athens and the message, it just bounced off the head of the people. They, they didn't receive what I had to say. And now here I am going to Corinth, the most wicked city on the place of the earth. How in the world am I going to get through to them? And at that time, I believe the Holy Spirit spoke to the heart of the Apostle Paul and told him to preach the cross. Oh. Preach the, the cross, Paul. Don't, don't preach anything else. Just preach the cross. Preach the wisdom of God, the testimony of God, and the power of God. Oh. What my son did for them on the cross of Calvary, just preach the cross. And it was on this track, it was on this walk where 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, it was birthed in the heart of the Apostle Paul. For I am determined not to know anything among you. I'm not worried about your wickedness and your perversion and the money and the philosophy that you've got. I'm determined not to know anything but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Thank you, Lord. And then there came the day that this little bow-legged Jewish man, he comes there into the city of Corinth, he mounts the pulpit, and he preached the gospel. He preached what Jesus did at the cross, that all of your sin, all of your wickedness, all your guilt was laid upon the back of God's Son, Jesus. He hung on a cruel cross. He was crucified for your sins. And no matter what you've been bound in, no matter what, what kind of sin you found yourself in, you can be saved. You can be set free. And then all of a sudden a miracle took place. These people who are into this idol worship and their immorality and prostitutes, these people humble themselves and they receive this message. They receive the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and their lives are changed. Hallelujah. The church is planted. There's a church now in the city of Corinth. 
And it serves as a testimony that this gospel works anywhere. I guarantee you, you go to any place on the face of the map and you won't have to look far to find somebody that will say, I'm not what I was thanks to a man named Jesus. I'm not what I was thanks to a man named Jesus. I'm no longer on my way to a devil's hell. I'm no longer bound by alcohol and drugs and nicotine and, and perversion. But no, I've been set free by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. And now Paul says that if any man, I want to tell you something, that's a universal call to any man. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, who you've been with, what you might have said, whatever took place in the past. And if you'll come and accept this Jesus, this Christ, you will be made a new creature, yes. a new person. Yes. The old man is dead. Hallelujah. Yes. Some people say that they've done too bad to, to get into heaven, but that's not the case. That's not what the Word of God says. Amen. And Paul says that if he can do it in Corinth, if he can do it in a wicked place like Corinth, he can do it here tonight. He can do it in, in Patterson, Louisiana tonight. It doesn't matter the color of your skin, what you may have done. None of that matters. If any man, woman, boy, girl, be in Christ Jesus, he'll make you a new creature. He'll make you a new creature. That's what's so great about this message. It ain't about what you do. It's about what Jesus did Amen. at the cross for you. You see, at the cross, Jesus represented you and I. Amen. All of our sin, all of our guilt, all of our shame was laid upon Him. And He bore it on Calvary. He drank the cup of God's judgment in our stead on the cross of Calvary. Hallelujah. And if we'll, the God says, my plan is so simple that if you'll just repent of that sin and come to me with faith in that act, in my Son and what He did, then I'll make you a new creature. Hallelujah. I'll erase the past and I'll give you a future. That's the offer that Amen. God has made us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And, and the word there, new, let me get a drink of this water. <laughs> The word there, new, it means previously non-existent. It means that all of a sudden you began to be far different than you were before. How many of you can testify to that? That the person that you are today, he didn't exist before you met Christ. He's, he's all, all of a sudden, you were headed south to a devil's hell. But then all of a sudden, here comes this Jesus into your heart and life. And now all of a sudden, you're just high-stepping north to glory. Hallelujah. A change of change the Lord has worked and wrought in your heart and life. All of a sudden you became totally different than what you were before. And he says that if any man be in Christ, he's a, a new creature. Not a rehab creature. Come on. But a new creature. You understand that God's not running a rehab program. Come on. That God just didn't, he doesn't take that old man and say, well, you know, he has a problem with, uh, he, he has hatred in his heart. He's addicted to drugs and alcohol, but he don't steal and rob. So if we can just tweak him a little bit, if we can just fix these few problems that he's got, he'll be a pretty good old boy. And maybe I can use him. No, God, when he looked at sinful man, he saw no good whatsoever. And that's the problem with false religion, all the religion out there that today, they'll tell you that if you'll just come to church, sit by me in Sunday school, say what I say, do what I do, then God's going to get you into heaven, let you into heaven when you die. It doesn't work like that. You can't clean up this old man, put some new clothes on him and some Esther Lauder and comb his hair and think God's going to let him sneak right on into heaven. It doesn't work like that. Just like if you went out to the pig mire, and you got a big old sow, and you brought her out there, and man, you scrubbed that baby up, put some baby uh, soap on him, and had him smelling good, got all the mud and whatever else was on him and on her, and put a dress on her and some lipstick, and named her Susie, and brought her on into your house. You can't expect that pig to take care of your house and act civilized because the nature that's within that pig is to make a mess. Come on, buddy. And to waller in a pig mire. She's gonna make a mess in your house. Amen. Just like if you if you had an old house 
and the structure of that house, the wood that's inside of that house was eaten with termites and oh, it's just rotten and down and weathered and wore out. You can't reuse that lumber and just patch it up and say that it's been made new. No, you don't have anything there to work with. And that's the way that our lives are. God doesn't have anything to work oh, with. Boy. In sinful man, our lives had to be stripped down all the way, destroyed and rebuilt by the master carpenter whose yeah. name is Jesus. Thank you, Lord. that old man that I had <laughs> wasn't no good in him. I proved that time and time again. I made a royal mess out of my life, but Jesus came, slayed that old life, gave me a new life. His Amen. name is Jesus. Yes. And how, how can you be made a new creature? Well, the words in Christ. Yes. If any man be in Christ. That's Romans 6, uh, verse 3, 4, and 5. That God took that old sinful man that you were, the one who stood guilty before the judge of all the earth uh, for breaking his moral law and was unable to keep it from the get-go, tainted by sin because of his father Adam. God took that old man and baptized him into the death Hallelujah. of His Son Jesus. When In the mind of God, when you believe in, in His Son Jesus, you were placed into Christ on the cross. And then you were placed into His burial where that old man, oh man, He's no longer exists, but He's been buried in a tomb and the lid has been shut tight and yeah. He ain't coming up out of there unless you leave the process Come that on. God has put you in. And then God raised up a new man. Thank you, Lord. And newness of life. How many of you believe that, that Lazarus was a little bit different after he come out of that tomb? Amen. I believe he walked just a little bit Amen. different since he come. I was thinking that. I drive an old wore out red tractor six days a week. And I was thinking about that on the tractor this week. I just believe Lazarus just acted a little bit different when he come up out of that tomb. When he'd been set free from those grave clothes yes. and he arose. That's the way you and I, when we've been born again by the Spirit of God, that old man is dead and God raised up a new man in newness of life and that life comes from the Holy Spirit before when you were out there living in the world living like the devil because you were a child of the devil Jesus said come on you didn't have the Holy right. Spirit right. and everything that you tried to do you just messed it up just like uh, there was a boy working with us and I got to notice and he hadn't been working for us very long and uh, all of a sudden I started noticing that all of my tools all of my toolboxes, every handle, every door handle, it just had grease all over it. it just, you go to touch anything, you just get grease all over your hand. Talking about like a quit, like you would grease a machine. And I got to noticing, I got to looking around trying to find, man, where's all this grease getting from? Every, everybody had grease on their hands and on their clothes. Where's all this mess coming from? Well, this, this guy, when he would grease his machine, he would use a pair of old greasy gloves to... Because that's a pretty dirty job when you're greasing that machine. But he never took the gloves off. So everything that he touched after that, it got grease on it. Well, that's the way our lives are. Every, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, everything that they did, it became sinful. It became tainted with sin because the source was sinful. And that's why every person since Adam, Adam was the federal head of the human race. He's the source of all human beings. That's right. And and he became sinful when he fell in the garden, thereby everybody that's been after uh, Adam, everybody that was born after him, they were born sinful. They were born dead in trespasses and in sin. Just like the, the Mississippi River, I know at times you, you couldn't even swim across it, but it starts as a, a little bitty stream up in Minnesota. It's one of the largest rivers in the world, a very powerful, wide and strong river, but it starts out just a little bitty stream up in Minnesota. And if you wanted to pull in the Mississippi River. Well, if you went to Baton Rouge and poured poison in it, well, you wouldn't really get it done because there's going to be water and portions up above that that would not be contaminated. But if you went to the source, if you went to that lake where the Mississippi River is formed and you pour pollution in it, then sooner or later all the water, every inch of it from there down, the whole river is going to be contaminated. That's where you and I come from. Our source come was on. polluted. Our our source was contaminated thereby. That's what we are. That's why there has to be a new man. Oh, hallelujah. There has to be a new man. That old man ain't getting into heaven. That old man, everything that he does is displeasing to God. God won't accept it. God won't embrace it. That's why we must be made new in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. 
And, and this new man, this new man that God created, he's now the difference is this first man, everything that he did was sin, but God makes a new man who's dead to sin. Amen. He's dead to sin. That's what the Bible teaches about believers. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin continue to live any longer therein? That old man had this sinful nature that drove him to go out into the world, commit sin, do everything that his evil, wicked heart uh, gave him the desire to do. But this new man, that sin nature has been broken and His dominion has been severed. And now Jesus sits on the throne in our hearts and He, he controls our lives. That's what the new man is. Amen. And in, in verse 1 it says, if any man be in Christ, in Him it speaks of Calvary. It speaks of Calvary. If you're going to be in Christ, if you're going to have a relationship with God, then you must embrace what God did in His Son at the cross. There is no other if entrance. There is no other way. And when you do embrace the cross, as I said, that, that corruptible nature, that sinful nature, it's been silenced. And now the divine nature takes over. And now there's new fruit. That's why He says here in verse 1, He says, Behold, all things are are become new. That word behold, it means to take a look. To take a look at it. What are we looking at? We're looking at this new life. We're, Amen. When you and I have been born again, when we've been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, there's going to be something to look at. There's going to be fruit there. So much of the church is a fruitless church. There's no fruit of the Spirit in their life. God doesn't have their way, His way in their life. Everything that they do is what that flesh wants to do. Come on. Whatever, the, whatever that evil heart compels them to do, that's what they do. They're driven by the flesh. What about you tonight? Do you have the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Can you look and see the, the way that you're going, the route that you're following in your life? Is it leading you towards holiness and righteousness and godliness? Or are you dominated by, by desires and lusts that you know didn't come from God? Come on. Have you been made a new creature in Christ Jesus? It's not just a religious show. It's going to be a lot of people that were in church all of their life. They raised their hands when the preacher said so. Sometimes they made amen. They said amen. Other times they come and put a check in the offering plate, but they're not going to make it into heaven because you have to be a new creature Hallelujah. to get to heaven. That old man's not getting in. There's no access for it. You understand that there's people in, in religion who they've lived their whole life a certain way. They, they wore long sleeves. They wore long dresses. They wore long hair. They never wore any makeup. They never wore an earring. And they thought that they were living their lives in a way that pleased God. And they thought that the way that their outer person looked, that they were pleasing God and they had a relationship with God because of what they did. But when they die and get into the next realm, they're going to find that the door of eternal life, the door of glory is going to be closed to them because they didn't come the way that God had made. They weren't in Christ Jesus. Doesn't mean, I've done got to the place where it doesn't matter to me about people who will say, well, I, I go to church. To say, that don't mean anything on, nowadays. Man. I'm going to tell you something. The devil wants you to be in a church. Come on. The devil wants you to hear enticing words of man's wisdom. The devil wants you to hear that everything is okay. Just keep on coming. Keep putting that check in the offering plate. But don't worry about how you're living. God just loves everybody. And everything you do makes God smile and giggle. That is a lie. Come on, brother. If you think you can't be saved by what you do, but if you are saved, there's going to be fruit in that life. Amen. Jesus said that we're going to know them by their fruits. Yes, Lord. By their fruits. If I love Jesus, if Jesus is calling the shot in Luke's life, then my feet's going to go where Jesus told them to go. My hands are going to do what Jesus set them for them to do. And my tongue, His name is going to be in my off, coming off of my lips. His word is going to be shut up in my heart like yeah. a fire, shut up in my bones, looking yeah. for somebody yeah. to tell it to. Hallelujah. Man. I know you want proof for that. Look over in Colossians chapter. 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're talking about fruit. We're talking about behold. Take a look. Look, there's, there's some things here that we can see 
In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 5, he says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, or have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? The word of the truth of the gospel, that's what we're preaching tonight. The message of the cross. Talking about what Jesus did for you and I, for sinful humanity on the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 6, he says, Which is coming to you as it is in all the world. And listen to this now. Bringeth forth fruit in you as it doth bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. Amen. When you begin to hear the right message, when you begin to hear the message of grace and faith that Brother Abair preaches, all of a sudden fruit began to be produced in your life. Not your fruit, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Law, legalism, false religion can't produce fruit, but this message, all of a sudden, since the day that you heard of it, not since the, you went through a 12-step program and you did all these, jumped through all these hoops, the preacher told you to jump through, but now all of a sudden, just by the hearing of faith, God began to produce fruit in your heart and life. Yes, Lord. Kind of looking at me strange. Is that the way it was in your life? Amen, and the day you began to hear the right message. Hallelujah. That God Almighty automatically, He began to do a work within your heart and life. All of a sudden, things that you struggled with all of your life Thank and you, you never could get free from, you never could try enough to get over that hurdle, all of a sudden they're gone. Yes. Now all of a sudden, we, we look back there and there's a, a dead bear. There's a dead lion and a dead Goliath Come on. walking behind oh. us. And it wasn't none of us, but it was the power of God <laughs> working Amen. through us as we Amen. submitted to the process of God. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 He, says, he says, behold, all things are become new. And this word, behold, it means as if you're contemplating a rapidly shifting scene, as if in a flash... Old things vanished and all things became new. You know, you ever had something just happen real fast in your life and circumstances just kind of tumble and do like that and you just got to sit down and think about this thing for a minute. But what would just happen? Well, that's what he says happened in the life of a person who's been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. That it happens. It's a rapidly shifting scene. It's not that you, as I said, you got in a rehab program or you got with an AA meeting or, or some kind of 40 days of purpose or some kind of garbage like that. And all of a sudden you evolve into a Christian. You understand the modern church is pretty much teaching people that if they'll sit in a pew and hear enough gospel, hear enough him saying and oh just be around people that love Jesus that all of a sudden they'll evolve into a Christian. You can't evolve into a Christian but you have to be born again. Yes. You have to be born a Christian. Arose in newness of life. Yes. Thank you Jesus. And then he says that old things have passed away and all things have become new. That means that your previous moral condition has perished and it's dead. That's how that you and I are not guilty before God because you can't charge a dead man. Come on. Everything that we did before in our lives, all of the sin that we committed, that man who was guilty of those charges was crucified with Christ on the cross. And now God's raised up a new man. A man that's not guilty. A man that God is able to work through and get His hands on and morph and, and shape and transform into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. If you look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. Romans 6 and verse 17. Talking about being made a new creature. Talking about how, how, does that, how does that come about? Well, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, he says, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. That's talking about that old man. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was given, which was delivered you. Obeying from the heart, you understand that's just believing. Amen. From your heart, you can't do any religious works. That shows you that you can't be saved because you got baptized. In water, you can't be saved because you joined the church. You can't be saved because you fed the hungry or gave somebody that was down on their luck a twenty dollar bill. None of that is in this transformation that takes place when an old man is miraculously transformed into a new creature. Hallelujah. You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then. 
At that moment, you believed the gospel. This is what happened. You were made free from sin. The sin nature, its power, its dominion was broken in your life. The moment that you expressed faith in God and His redemption plan, what His Son did at Calvary, God rushed in and He broke the power and the dominion of sin over your life. Hallelujah. And you became the servants of of righteousness. It happened just that quick. That quick. Amen. Behold, all of a sudden, it's, it, the, the author said that it's like beholding a rapidly shifting scene. It happens that fast in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Just in the same time it's going to take for the rapture to take place, all of a sudden, it's going to be a bunch of folks sitting around and then boom, just like that, a whole lot of them ain't going to be there no more. Folks are going to be sitting around wondering what happened. All of a sudden, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And the same thing happened in your life the moment that you believed the gospel. Hallelujah. Amen. You were transformed. You, you went from being a servant of sin, a slave of sin, and now all of a sudden you become a servant. Of righteousness. Yes, Lord. That's the great change that Thank God. You. Amen. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand. Cut the clap of praise. Hallelujah. And that's what it is. We've been raised in newness of life. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18. Now the apostle says that all things are of God. All things are of God. What things? All these new things. This new life. This new desire. This new heart. This new uh, urge that I have in my heart to know God and to do righteousness and read and study and uh, my Bible and have communion with the Lord. All of this comes from God. It's of God. It's of the Holy Spirit is not of you. Right. If what you're doing is comes from you, from your from your flesh, then you may start out hot. You, you're just going to be like a firecracker with Come a on. short fuse and some pretty colors and a few pops and crackles, but then that's it. That's all it does. Just a, a made in China firework. But Jesus, if He lights the fire, it ain't going out. Amen. Amen. We're just like that energizer bunny. We're just going to keep going. Keep going and keep going. I hurt my back yesterday. We we raised cattle too at home, and yesterday we were uh, we were uh, checking on. We were down below a pond levee where there's a lot of mud, and I have a four year old son, and I was carrying him through the mud, and I, somehow I hurt my back uh, yesterday. And uh, you know, somebody called me on my way down here and said, "Oh, did, did you decide to go?" And I said, "Yeah, of course." I went, and I started thinking about those football players. They'll play hurt. They'll play crippled. They'll play sick. They'll do any of that. Well, we ought to be like that. The gospel Amen. of Jesus Amen. Christ, yeah. willing to suffer, willing to go the extra mile because, man, this thing is not just something that I do, it's who I am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Given a ministry of reconciliation, Amen. called by God to preach the gospel. And just yes. like our brother saying, there's going to be somebody that wouldn't have heard. There's going to be somebody that didn't know and they died lost. But if I would have just been obedient to God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. He'll give you the strength. He'll give you the strength to get through. That's good preaching, brother. And number two, this new life, it belongs to God. Amen. You understand, there's so many Christians that they're controlled and they're dominated by their flesh. When the song leader says, just lift your hands and worship God, you say, I ain't doing it. I ain't going to do it. You know what that is? That's your flesh. Come on. You're just like an undisciplined child that needs bent over his mama's knee and that hand, that little high rear end tan. Come but that's on. your flesh that's controlling what you do. And, and, and they're undisciplined. The Bible says that whom the Lord loves, He chastens. Yes. He chastises us. And, you know, if you, have, if you have children and you love those children, you don't just let them do whatever they want to do. You don't let them call the shots and decide what's best for them. And if you are, get ready to visit them in the penitentiary on, someday on, soon. But you love them, so you discipline them. And you raise them and you train them up in the ways of the Lord. And sometimes that involves maybe be raising your voice or putting a, a leather belt on, on their on. on their backside and it's not because you hate the child or you despise the child but it's because you love yes. that boy you love that girl and you want to raise them up amen to be productive amen. citizens and if you're a Christian it's not just productive citizens but you want them to be children and ambassadors for Christ Hallelujah. I want my family to stand apart from a wicked and a perverse generation because for me in my household, we're going to serve God. Amen. 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 
but God, but we're, we're not our own. That's, that's what I was getting at. You, you really don't have the right. The moment that you surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you gave Him your life. Yes. And if you, you have a problem with that, you need to look back at where you were when He found you. Yeah. And the sin that was in your life and the place that you had brought your own self to. You're not your own. You've been bought with a very high price. Yeah. The blood of Jesus, that's the price that was paid to redeem you, to buy you back from sin and from the property of, the, of Satan. And now you're not your own. You, you, we don't have the right to call the shots. We're to be under the leadership. The Bible says that those that are, that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Amen. Right. Otherwise, you're rebelling against the leadership of God and you need Him to lead your life. Because yes. we, you and I, we've already seen what our life is like with us in charge. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a mess. It ain't pretty. A whole lot of stuff that happened back there you don't want anybody to know about. And you ain't going to tell it. You're going to take that stuff to your grave. Well, to keep that from happening again, we remain submitted to God's plan, God's provision, and God's process. And let, let's let this new man, let's let people see the new man and not the old man. Amen. Yes, yes. That's what's the problem with a whole lot of Christians today. They walk around in the flesh, dominated by that sin nature, and all people see is that old man. That old nature. Help us, Lord. And then he says in verse 18 that God who hath reconciled us unto Himself. The word it, it reconciled, it means to receive into God's favor. As I've already said, you and I were born in a state of sin and, 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 and corruptibility. And, the, and you remember in the Old Testament, you uh, well... It, at the time of Christ, even when the temple uh, was was there and, and they had the sacrifices and there, there was a veil that prevented entrance into the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest once a year could only go into the Holy of Holies and he had to go in there with blood. And then the, the, the veil that was up there, I was studying, man, this thing was 60 feet tall. 60 feet tall. It'd be like you stack 10 of me on top of one another. That'd be 60 feet tall. This is a big curtain. And it was 30 foot wide of just a very big curtain inside of this temple. And it was four inches thick. I'm talking about a piece of fabric. Can you imagine how long it took them to weave it and make that thing? Well, that thing was to serve as a purpose to separate God from man. And the reason that man couldn't go in there was because of sin. And the real reason that the veil was there is not to protect God, it's to protect man. Yeah. Because if we go into the presence of God with sin, we would be struck dead. They said that they, when the high priest would go in there, if God didn't accept the sacrifice, then he would fall dead. If he didn't accept that blood, he would fall dead. And they tied a little veil and a rope around the man's foot because no one else wanted to go in there and get him out after he died. So they would pull that dead priest out of there. That's the separation that's between God and man because of sin. But the Bible says that He has reconciled us. He has, he has saved us. He's received us into His favor. Well, how did that happen? The Bible says in Colossians 1.20 that Jesus, having made peace through the blood of His cross, reconciled all things back unto Himself. So Jesus at the cross, He made peace between a sinful man and a holy God. The word, the Greek word there for made peace, it means to bind together. To bind together so sinful man can be redeemed. They can be, uh, they can be reconciled. They can be received into the favor of God based upon what Jesus Christ did at the cross. As our sin and our shame and our guilt, it was laid upon Him. It was laid upon Christ. He drank the cup of God's judgment that should have fallen on us. He took our place. If you read in Isaiah chapter 1, God uh, makes a plea to the children of Israel through the prophet Isaiah. And He says, oh, you're a sinful nation, a, a seed of evildoers, a, a corrupt people, a people heavy laden with iniquity. He said, you're full of wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that cannot be bound. They cannot be mollified with ointment. In other words, you can't fix the problem that you've got. He said, from the top of your head to the soul of your foot, there's no soundness there. You're altogether undone. But if you read on just a little bit further to about verse 18, God's through the prophet, He says, come now. 
Yeah. Let us reason together. Hallelujah. Let us reason together. Isn't that amazing? I always thought that that was amazing. You would think that sinful man on his way to hell and torment forever, that we would just be knocking and beating and pleading at the door of heaven saying, God, can we please make a deal? Can we strike up a bargain? Please, is there anything that we can do to get back in the right standing with you? But instead of that, God is knocking on the hearts of men saying, let me in. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus, then the Holy Spirit is knocking on the door of your heart saying, let me in. You I might have woke it. up this morning knowing that you were headed for a devil's hell, but let me tell you, it doesn't have to be that way. Yes. The story doesn't have to end there. But you can be reconciled to God because all of the sin and the perversion and the filth that you may be living in was placed upon Jesus, Hallelujah. the perfect sinless Lamb of God. At the cross of Calvary, God's perfect Son took the place of Adam's fallen sons. Mm, yeah. The perfect, the, the guiltless took the place of the guilty. The righteous took the place of the unrighteous. And God says that you can be reconciled. He has reconciled us by Christ Jesus. Yes, yes Lord. And when it says by Christ Jesus, it's talking about the cross. Yes. Yes. That baby in the manger never saved nobody. Come on. Oh, that good. man that fed multitudes with just a few fishes and a couple of loaves of bread, him doing that didn't save anybody. Right. Him raising Lazarus from the dead, it never saved anybody. Him calming the storm when Peter uh, was drowning, that never saved anybody. But what he did at the cross of Calvary, the blood that he shed, that's what saved humanity. And instead, the church, the modern church, they just want these little lovey-dovey, non-abrasive, non-offended messages where the preacher just stares at the clock and it's just, oh, dearly beloved, just a mess like, no, nobody's ever been saved through a smile or a kiss or a hug, but it takes the preaching of the gospel, a face-to-face -face confrontation that if you haven't been reconciled to God by Christ Jesus, your soul is damned to an eternal hell. Yes. It's cut and dry. It's black and white. There is no gray area. People talk about straddling the fence when it comes to the truth of Jesus and His cross. You don't straddle the fence. Either you're in or you're out. That's the way that it's going to be. Either you're in or you're out. Either you've been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. You can look at the... There was a timeline up there just a few minutes ago before church started. But just like if you looked at the timeline that's within your life, if you can't point to it and say that there was a day, a time, an hour where Jesus came into my heart and He made me a new creature, then you need to evaluate your heart and your life tonight. Yes. I don't ever come to scare anybody, but I do want people to take inventory Hallelujah. and look at the life that you're living on. We're not saved by what we do, but if we are saved by grace through faith, the Bible says in, in Ephesians 2 and verse 8 that you are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Skip down to verse 10. You were created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Hallelujah. You are His craftsmanship. Yes. He bought you. All things are of God. All these new things. And He's reconciled us to Himself. Through Christ Jesus, as I've already said, Christ is the reconciler. Yeah. He's in the ministry of reconciliation. That's what He came to do. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. For the Son of Man is not coming to the world to condemn the world, but that the world by Him might be saved. That's it. God, the will of God for your life is that you be saved, number one. We'll worry about the rest. Don't worry about the sin or whatever bondage that you might be in. The will of God on, on top of all the priority is that you be saved, that you be raised from the dead into new of life. That's what God's will is for you and I. Amen. And all the rest will follow in His place. Thank you, I can point to a night where I, God found me laid on my belly in an old wore out camper trailer. And everything that I am today, in my, and I'm not much, I'm not boasting in myself, but anything that I've, I've ever been able to do in the work of God, it came from that night where Jesus found me laying on hopeless 
died in trespasses and in sin, just this far away from losing my family, everything that mattered to me. But God rushed in, and that old man is dead. I'm Hallelujah. not guilty. I'm not going to hell. All my sins have been washed, erased by the blood of Christ, and now all things have become new. You, Do you have that testimony tonight? Can you say, is that a reality in your life? Amen. Because that's the way that it's going to be. You know, when you get the Bible talks about a people who approach God and say, well, didn't we do good works in your name? Didn't we cast out devils? Didn't we preach in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. It's not. There's going to be some people that you thought would have made it to heaven that didn't make it. There's going to be some folks up there that you never would have thought would have come in. Because it's not so much about what you do. It's what you believe in your heart. Amen. That's what separates the people that's Amen. on the narrow path that leads to life and the wrong way that leads to destruction. Destruction is what they believe in their heart. Amen. Christ is the reconciler. He felt for the people. He wept for the people. And then He died to reconcile. Understand that the cross is the ministry of reconciliation. God don't work through anything outside of that. As I said earlier, you can clothe naked people, feed hungry people, give a blanket to cold people. But ain't none of that really going to help them. It's the gospel. It's faith in Christ and what He did at the cross that reconciles sinful man unto a holy God. Our peace was made. The only peace that you'll ever know with God had come through the blood of Calvary. Amen. The blood of that cross. And there He reconciled a sinner sinful people back unto himself. But now the Bible says in, in verse 18 that he had given us the ministry of reconciliation. As I said earlier, most people just want to find a good seed and wait for the rapture to take place. But it's the will of God that your reconciliation, your being saved, leads to others being reconciled. Amen. Otherwise, if you were a finished product and complete, God would have done took you on to glory. But he has you here for a reason. It's because people outside these walls are lost and dying and going to hell and if you are saved and you have Christ in you the hope of glory you have this treasure in earthen vessels and God's will is that you open your mouth and let it all come out so people can hear that just like you did and they can they will obey that from their heart believe it from their heart and be taken from a slave of sin to a servant of righteousness Amen. that's the will of God the lost person out there his only hope is that you'll come along and tell them about Jesus. Thank you, Lord. That's the only hope that they have. People, man, people are having problems that you never would have dreamed of in this world of sin and wickedness. People are hurt. Yes. They may put on a smile and a lot of makeup and try to fill the void with, you know why that person goes to the store and gets a case of beer every day? You know why they, they're always hitting up that drug dealer? You know why they're always looking for somebody new to sleep with? Come on. They're hurting. They're hurting on the inside. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And the only thing that can help them is Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The preaching of the gospel, the yeah. minister of reconciliation. You know, I, I grew up and I was always told that, oh, you're just supposed to live it before them. Just live this Christian life before them and they'll see that you're always happy and you're always smiling and sooner or later they're going to ask you what it is that makes you different. I have never had that happen to me. Come on. We live in a day and age where this person's always out, always out to try to outdo the next person. This one's trying to jump this one and get ahead and look better and, and accomplish more than the other person. It's a day of competition. So naturally, that sinful, corruptible heart of man is not going to ask you what it is that makes you so happy, so good, so perfect. Whatever it is that they see in you, they're not going to ask you what it is. They're just, as, as I said, they're going to be out to try to outdo you. But what you need to do is open your mouth and preach the gospel. Hallelujah. Don't worry about what you don't know. I'm telling you something. You know more than you think you That's know. Right. If you've been listening to the message of the cross for a while, then you know more than you think you know. And if you'll just open your mouth and yield your tongue, then God will speak through you. The Bible says that we are all, we're to be always ready to give an account for the faith 
that dwells in us. That's why we need to be under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we'll give somebody some little churchy answer. Well, God loves you and we'll, we'll pray for you and stuff like that. But what they really need is a word from the Lord. They need the, the Holy Spirit to speak to them. And God speaks through people. Amen. And not just perfect people. God don't have no perfect people. If he was looking for perfect people to use, he wouldn't have anybody to use. But he's just looking for somebody that's willing to Amen. use. And he says, he says here that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. We've been given a ministry of life. If people will listen to what we have, if they'll listen to this good news, it'll bring life into their heart. It's a ministry of grace. The law was a ministry of death. On the day that the law was given, 3,000 people were killed at Mount Sinai. And I, I preached a message a while back about Jesus healing a leper. And the law for the leper were they were supposed to stay a hundred foot away from anybody that wasn't contaminated. And they were supposed to wear a, a special garment on their back. And everywhere they went, they were supposed to cry, unclean, unclean, unclean. That was what the law in that day said for them to do. But we read about this leper in the Word of God who came running up to Jesus and he hit his knees and he said, Lord, if you're willing, will thou come? can't make me clean. In other words, Lord, if you're willing, I know you can do it. I know that you can heal me. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the leprous man and healed him. And if he would have been in, caught in that law, trying to achieve righteousness by obedience to the law, it would have kept him bound and he would have died a leper. But he came under grace through the ministry of Jesus. Jesus is that reconciler and he's reaching. But law... All it does, it keeps you bound. The law preacher, I thought of it, you know, he's really like a grim reaper with a, with a Kaiser blade and a black cloak. Nobody wants to see that coming. Nobody smiles when they see that coming. And that's what law does. It, it burdens you down and it increases the dominion of sin that's in your life. But gee, God says how beautiful are the feet of those that bring the good news, that bring glad tidings. That's the ministry of grace. And it's the only thing that can help people on the day of Pentecost was when the church began. Peter, Peter uh, preached a sermon at Pentecost and 3,000 souls were saved. Do you see the difference? Grace brings life. This new covenant, this ministry of reconciliation, it brings life. Law brings death. That's just the way it is. Amen. Reconciliation. You, you know, there's people out that uh, and I, I experienced some of this uh, in my own life. You know, that talking about reconciliation there they have family problems they have marriage problems and their their home is out of order and it's just chaos nobody gets along with anybody and you know no matter how many times they apologize to their spouse or to their children or to whoever they always find themselves right back where they were before in that place and, and they try to reconcile with one another try to make peace with one another I'm sorry for what I said sorry for what I did where I went and who I was with and all of that, but it's just an endless cycle of I'm sorry and, and trying to reconcile. But the problem is, is they, they need to be reconciled to God. If you get things right with God, then everything back at home will get back into order. But until then, all the apologizing and I'm sorry, it's really useless because you're going to be caught right there again and again. I know that's the way that it was in my life, but it wasn't until I was reconciled unto God then my own house got in, got in order. Amen. My own house became in order. That's the ministry of reconciliation. He has given us a ministry of reconciliation. Who did He give it to? He gave it to the ones that He's reconciled. He has reconciled us and He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. He gives the ministry to the new creature because the old creature, He's not ministering to anybody. Number one, because he only cares about himself and he's not w willing to help anybody else unless it would benefit him. And number two, that old creature dominated by the flesh, nobody wants to listen to what he has to say. Because he's mean, he's ugly, and he's selfish. And that's why you and I need to be uh, faithful to this process that we got in in the first place so that the Spirit of God is able to lead us. 
and He's able to guide us so that we can minister to others. As I said, that old preacher is not ministering to anybody because nobody wants to hear what he has to say. If they open their mouth to testify of Jesus, to testify of Christ, automatically a wall comes up in front of people because they don't want to be like He is. Whatever it is that made you like you are, I don't want that. But a new creature, a person that's been born by the Spirit of God, led by the, by the Spirit of God, controlled by the Spirit of God, that's a person that God can be able to use. Jesus said, let your light shine before men where they'll glorify your Father that is in heaven with the true fruit of the Spirit, not something that comes from some man-made law, begins to flow out of us. That's when we're de different from that world. Amen. That's a, Christians that are not in bondage to the sin nature, they stick out like a sword thumb. We're different than other people are. We're not bound by what they're bound by. We're not better than anybody, but we're saved by the blood of Jesus. And that's why we're here to reconcile for a ministry of reconciliation. And what it says here hath given us, what's being said there is that God has deposited the doctrine of reconciliation into the souls of the preacher of the gospel. In other words, he's lodged that in our souls. That's who I want preaching to me. Not a six foot icicle, but somebody whose God has deposited this message in their soul. Where it's not just in their head, but it's in their heart. It's in their soul. That's what Jeremiah one time in Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9, Jeremiah got a little upset with God because of some events that took place in his life. Jeremiah said, I'm not going to speak his name. I'm not going to speak the word of God. But he said that he was weary with holding it in and it was like a fire shut up in his heart. God's word was in his heart like a fire shut up in his bones. The apostle Paul said that it's a necessity that's yes. laid upon me. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Yes. Yes. The ministry of of reconciliation is lodged into the souls Hallelujah. of the ministry of the gospel. Not where you have to work something up to tell the people, but when it says that He hath given us, it means that He's, he's, thoroughly, he's thoroughly furnished. He's fully equipped us with the ministry of reconciliation. That's how you know who's been sent from God and who's been sent from man. It's what they show up and what spews out of their mouth. Come if it's on. all about their church and their ministry and what they're doing, that's not going to reconcile anybody. Come on. Crossway Ministries in Greenwood, Mississippi can't reconcile anybody. But what Jesus did at the cross of Calvary is God's way of reconciliation. Yes. Amen. The way that God, we can be received back into the favor of God and that ministry is to compel men, to compel all sinners to, to repent of their sin yes, and trust in the atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Lord. You know, I know when I, I was young, I, I never really had this thing explained to me uh, about salvation and about the gospel and what it really meant to be saved. But this is just, just as simple as I can put it. That if you'll just repent of your sins, turn from those sins and from your heart, believe in Jesus, that He is the Son of God, and that He died on the cross to pay for your sin, three days later, God raised Him from the dead, then you will be saved. Amen. You will be saved. And day by day, from that time on, you continue to believe that. That's what it means to be reconciled to God. It's not about what you do, but it's all about what He did. You be faithful to Christ and to His process. God will be faithful to see you on into glory. In verse 19, it says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world back unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Reconciliation is a work of God's love from God's heart. That's what the whole plan of the cross, it come from God's heart. When, when Adam sinned in the garden, God had the right and the authority. He could have just put Adam and Eve and the devil, He could have locked them all up in the same room and set the room on fire and just been done with it. But out of His heart of love, He didn't do that. And also the holiness of God would not allow Him to just received back a sinful people. So He made a way of reconciliation. And in that, in, in His love, He sent His Son to be the mediator. And that's what God has put. He's put an offer on the table. He's put an offer of reconciliation. And as I said earlier, that's the will of God, number one for our lives, is that you'd be saved. In this life, it won't matter how much money 
that you had. It won't matter what kind of boyfriend or girlfriend that you had, what kind of car you drove, or what clothes you wore, or what job you had. All that's going to matter is, as I said, you look back at that timeline in your life and you found where the Spirit of God came into your heart, where Jesus came into your heart and He saved you and He made you a new creature. Amen. That's all that's going to matter. God's put an offer on the table. You can't come up any other way. You have to come through Christ. That's what the Bible says. All the ways you can be reconciled. Would you stand with me tonight?